Okay, the title of my talk is Evolutionary Innovation Viewed as Novel Physical Phenomena and Hierarchical System Building. This is work that's de a development of the paper I published in the Open Ended Evolution Special Issue in the A Life Journal. Um, and in that paper, I set out a view of different kinds of evolutionary innovation based upon Bantef et al.'s earlier work. For the purposes of this talk, I just want to make the basic distinction between two different types of open-endedness. The first involves a continual search in a given search space. And the second, I'm gonna to lump together as open-endedness that involves an expansion of the search space, opening up new possibilities that weren't previously available. In my previous paper, I looked at a variety of different mechanisms that are currently, currently commonly discussed in the theoretical biology literature um, and asked where they got you in terms of open-ended evolution. I also pointed out that that framework didn't uh, include population level mechanisms, uh, which are also important like genetic drift, gene flow, neutral networks. Um, but if you consider all of those mechanisms, uh, it turns out these only really relate to exploratory open-endedness, so search within a given search space. The question is, what about the other kinds? So these other more interesting kinds of open-endedness um, involve a door-opening state in the search space that opens up possibilities not previously available. In my previous paper, I discussed ways in which this could happen in terms of transdomain bridges and non-additive compositional systems. In the current paper, I want to generalize those two topics. And I'm going to talk in terms of capturing new physical phenomena and system building. And the question I'm going to ask is, can all evolutionary innovations be understood in these terms? So taking the first of these new physical phenomena, at the end of the previous paper, I introduced this new way of looking at behavior in a system in terms of three different spaces. One is the parameter space. That's the information space um, of a, an organism that specifies some kind of material organization in the world. Um, that material organization is then acted upon by the laws of physics or dynamics of the system to pr produce an action. So there are three distinct spaces here. There's parameter space, organization space, and action space. An advantage of taking this view is that it makes explicit the process of, of involved in these door opening events. So they involve the discovery of a new state in organization space, which then produces novel behaviors in action space. And in that perspective, new transformational behaviors can arise if the organization is able to utilize new features of the laws of physics in action space that weren't previously available. Or even if the organization in organization space represents a new boundary condition that makes actions in action space likely that previously have been very unlikely. I just want to show this nice video. This is work by Toby House and Josie Hughes and Fumia Ida in Cambridge. They were exploring the space of behaviors of a simple paper aeroplane, which was just a V shape. And all they did was vary the length of the V and the angle of the V. What they found by making these alterations in organization space, um, these simple alterations produced very different classes of behavior. They actually found four different classes of behavior depending upon the exact combination of length and angle. So that's just a nice demonstration of this view of um, action arising out of the, the interaction of an organization with the rules of physics. Okay. Some advantages of this approach, it moves away from representing behaviors attached to particular components in the system. So lots of A-Life software systems have like components which move left, eat, motor sensor. And if you have that, then it's very hard to evolve beyond what you've already pre-programmed into the system. So it's mo more, moving more towards a view of action as dynamics mediated by the laws of physics 
and initiated by these components. Okay, so the second aspect of what I want to talk about today is this idea of system building, um, which is a generalization of what I previously talked about as non-additive compositional systems. In a recent paper in the Trends in Ecology and Evolution journal, Tim Lenton and colleagues argue that natural selection can occur in systems above reproducing individuals, such as ecosystems, based solely upon differential persistence. So that raises the question for me, if all levels of biological life can be understood in terms of persistent systems, can we understand evolutionary innovations in these terms too? Uh, going back to the systems literature of various flavors, of course, there are lots of attempts to characterize um, and describe systems at different levels in common terms. Um, one early, quite nice and general way to do this was described by de Rosny in the 70s. He talked about systems in terms of structural characteristics and functional characteristics. And these um, methods have been improved upon somewhat since then. So if we think about innovations in terms of a system, making changes to a system, that suggests there are three types of innovation that might be possible. One would be a change to an existing structural or functional element within a system. So a change to a, a, a component or a relationship within the system. Another type of innovation would be the addition of a new element or deletion of an existing element from the system. And then a third would be a creation of a new hierarchical level of system built upon lower level systems. One final point I wanted to make just now was that um, if we consider the process of generation of phenotypes from genotypes, which is an important aspect of open-ended evolution, um, this fits very nicely into this view of uh, POA view of behavior and system building. So uh, you need both of those um, combined give, to give you a nice picture of the evolution of progressively more complex genotype to phenotype maps. And I just wanted to point out that that view resonates quite well with various other uh, work in the recent literature on this kind of thing. Okay, so to summarize, my claim here is that evolutionary innovations involve physics-based novelties and hierarchical system building. And the question is, can all innovations be understood in this way? Could this be a consistent description of evolutionary innovations at all levels from cells to ecosystem, ecosystems and cultures? I'm certainly not claiming this is a panacea, but this perspective connects questions of evolutionary innovations to the existing literature on systemic approaches to understanding biology and technological phenomena. Okay, thank you.